right, uh, greetings listeners and newcomers to Red Ice Radio. Thank you for stopping by. It's good to have you with us today. My name is Henrik Palmgren, and I hope that you are comfortable when and wherever you are in the world and uh, ready for some eye-opening, mind-expanding and revealing radio as we are going to go into the electric universe with our guest Wallace Thornhill today who joins us from Australia. I hope that you're familiar with his work. Uh, if not, this is, will be a good uh, opportunity uh, for you to learn about some of his work and research. Uh, he has been working close with David Talbot over at Thunderbolts.info, and he's uh, one of the voices in the excellent Thunderbolts of the Gods DVD. He is also the author of the book, The Electric Universe. Uh, we here at Red Ice have been following the electric universe theory with uh, great interest over the years, and Wall, together with David, have been doing some really fascinating work and uh, discoveries over the years. Uh, and as you might remember, if you have been us, uh, with us here for a while on Red Ice Radio, we've had uh, both Donald Scott and also Rens van der Sluis with us on the program before who uh, also are associated with Thunderbolts.info. Uh, Wolf's own personal website is holoscience.com. That's the place to go to find out more about him and his material and his book, of course. Uh, but also do take a look at Thunderbolts.info to see a lot of Wolf's contributions there. Uh, so with that, welcome to Red Eyes Radio, Wallace. It's uh, great to have you with us, and thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Hendrik. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Uh, so much uh, that I want to talk with you about, and I'm very excited to have you on the program with us. But maybe first, as a, as a way of introducing uh, you to our listeners a little bit, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background first and, and, and uh, in terms of when you first got involved uh, in researching the electric universe. Okay. Um, I'm an Australian, and I was born in Melbourne, in uh, Victoria. And I went to university uh, at Melbourne University, and did physics and electronics, but in some respects I was almost self-taught in electronics because uh, while I was at university I was um, fixing television sets uh, as a means of um, raising a bit of cash. Uh, while before I went to university I had read a book which I think could be said to be uh, something that changed my life and that was Emmanuel Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision. And uh, I was very surprised when I got to the university to find uh, disinterest and even hostility towards his ideas, which were that the solar system has a recent history. When I say recent, uh, I mean in prehistory, but remembered by uh, uh, modern humans. And uh, I began a research year with uh, an upper atmosphere group, uh, but it Halfway through that year, I decided that uh, academia was no place for me because uh, I wouldn't get any answers to the questions that I had, and I'd have to research them on my own. So I joined the uh, computing industry and uh, spent my career uh, with IBM and with the Australian government. In part of that work with the government, I got to travel a lot overseas, and I was involved with the uh, Society for Interdisciplinary Studies in England, and was on their committee when I was uh, posted to London for several years. Uh, when I got back home, I uh, got in touch with David Talbot, whom I'd actually met in 1974 uh, at the uh, International Conference on Velikovsky's work in uh, Canada. Mm. Uh, at the time, neither of us knew precisely what the other one was up to. But in 90, 1994, exactly 20 years later, I rang him to see if he had a copy of uh, his book called The Saturn Myth, which dealt with a reconstruction of something that came out of a, a um, story that was not published at the time by Velikovsky about the m memory of uh, the planet Saturn as a sun, which is quite an odd concept. Mm -hmm. Uh, David uh, said to me that uh, he didn't have any copies of the book to sell uh, and he did, had no plans to republish it because he'd advanced so far beyond that that uh, it wasn't worth uh, republishing. But he said that he was having an international conference uh, in Portland, Oregon and uh, asked me if I had something to contribute. Well, uh, as it happened, I certainly did. So uh, I attended that conference and I found what David was uh, working on at that time 
and I said to him that uh, we should collaborate because what you've shown me are electrical effects in space. And uh, from that point, our collaboration grew and I spent some time in the US uh, uh, speaking at uh, various conferences over there. Uh, the Thunderbolts group was set up. Uh, we began publishing books and DVDs and films and so on. And uh, the result of all this uh, has culminated in what you now see on the websites. Excellent. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, really, it's a fascinating uh, study also to see how Thunderbolts have, have grew and how a lot of additions have come to it throughout the years. And uh, uh, yes. w were you also interested in terms of the, 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 the ancient, if we can call it that, then the st ancient structure of the solar system in terms of Velikovsky and also what David Talbot then brought out that, that you, if I put it this way, do, do you go in line with the uh, catastrophe theory in, in that regard, that, that something happened in our solar system uh, in, in past as well? Yes, while I was at university, I spent a lot of time in the anthropology shelves at the uh, university library, and I discovered that the evidence that Velikovsky had amassed for something strange going on in the solar system was, uh, it just leapt off the page. It didn't matter what I read, whether it was referenced by Velikovsky or not. Uh, the picture was quite clear that something had happened. Consequently, uh, I... Uh, I decided that I needed to find out what it was that we didn't know about gravity, about what controls the uh, planets and their motions around the sun, because it was evident from what Velikovsky said that uh, electricity played some role, but we don't see that happening today. And in fact, I was lucky enough to be able to take advantage of uh, a trip to uh, Washington, D.C. to ring Velikovsky at his home in uh, Princeton, New Jersey, and he very kindly uh, uh, gave me an invitation to visit him, uh, along with my family who were with me at the time. And so I got to talk to him about this question, because really the astronomers had dismissed his views out of hand because they said that it didn't uh, meet Newton's uh, laws of uh, the dynamics of the solar system. Hmm. And so I said to Velikovsky, what is it we don't understand about gravity? And he gave me a, a slim volume, uh, which he was not keen to have uh, republished, uh, which talked about the cosmos without gravitation. And he was of the view that gravity itself was a weak electrical force. Uh, I took that idea away with me, and a few years later, I came across a small uh, advertisement in the Scientific American. It was in 1981. And it was called the Journal of Classical Physics, and that interested me greatly because I felt that we needed to return to the common sense of classical physics and find out where we'd uh, more or less left the rails, so to speak, mm. in uh, modern physics. And uh, that uh, gave me the clues. I, I wrote to the editor of that small journal, uh, and uh, we corresponded and visited each other, and uh, from that grew the idea of the electrical nature of matter and how the gravitational force could actually be explained. Mm. Out of that, it took many years, though, to get over the idea that Einstein had in some way explained what gravity was. He hadn't. All he'd given was uh, a mathematical expression which uh, works but doesn't explain anything. Uh, and so I was looking for a simple explanation, and I think uh, I found the essence of it. And it does explain how the planetary system could have been quite chaotic some thousands of years ago and yet achieve a stability which makes it look as though it's been uh, wound up like clockwork. Hmm. Well, it's, it's a fascinating theory and, and we're definitely going to get uh, more into it here as we, as we go along. Uh, uh, maybe you can give us a brief outline of, of the, the theory of the electric universe if we have some listeners out there uh, that uh, might not be familiar uh, with this idea yet, Well. Well, it's pretty confronting. Uh, the first thing we say is that we do not understand the sun and that the th idea that it's a thermonuclear uh, uh, energy source is incorrect. And in fact, it works in much the same way as uh, scientists on Earth have tried to recreate the energy of the sun by uh, fusion experiments where they pour a huge amount of electrical energy 
into this system to try and get a little bit of thermonuclear energy out. Well, stars do the same thing. They accept a huge amount of electrical energy from their environment, from the galaxy, and environment from the galaxy. And the result is a small amount of nuclear reactions and the creation or the generation of um, heavier elements, which we see in the solar spectrum. Uh, there was an engineer who um, was associated with Velikovsky and whom I consider to be uh, a brilliant fellow, but unknown. Uh, and he pointed out that all of the obvious features of the sun have no place being there for, uh, if you uh, just use the thermonuclear theory in an effort to explain them. He said, if you look at it dispassionately, all of the features of the sun can be explained in terms of a gas discharge. And uh, from this simple basis, he was able to describe all the features we see on the sun, the granulation, the spicules, the hot corona, and so on. Uh, so um, the first thing we have to get around is the idea that stars are not thermonuclear bombs somehow controlled and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, contained so that they don't explode. <laughs> Um, this also raises the issue then, okay, if the sun is powered electrically, where does it get its power from? If the galaxy is has electric currents flowing in it, mm. where do they flow and how are they generated? And the answer to that is that uh, the radio astronomers have been able to map these current flows by the signals they give out in the radio uh, spectrum, and they find that galaxies are strung like Catherine wheels on these huge intergalactic filaments. And so it seems that uh, electric power from beyond the galaxy actually uh, forms galaxies and stars themselves. <clears throat> this raises all sorts of other questions about the Big Bang theory and um, origins and so on. And what we can say is that we don't know enough yet to be able to even ask the right questions about origins. Uh, we, our ignorance is so profound since we've got s so much wrong that uh, we have to start all over again. What we can say from observations is that the universe is of unknown age and of unknown extent. So it's not, uh, um, what is it now that they're up, up to 16 billion years or something like that? They, they throw out a, a number, but you'd, uh, you'd refute that? <clears throat> Well, all we can say is that uh, there have been all sorts of anomalies with uh, these pronouncements, uh, like finding stars that appear to be older than the uh, uh, the universe, <laughs> <laughs> and so on. Uh, it really is presumptuous of us to think that we can talk about origins, uh, creation of the universe, um, and particularly when certain evidence is overlooked. Uh, some of that evidence shows that uh, redshift is not a measure of velocity of recession. Uh, most of it isn't anyway. That redshift is actually associated with the age of an object. So that uh, these quasars, as they call them, which are supposed to be at the ends of the universe and extremely bright, are actually quite close. They're associated with nearby galaxies and they're faint because they are newly born. And there's a kind of a biological aspect uh, uh, to the electric universe because the empirical evidence shows that galaxies, active galaxies, give birth to quasars which then evolve into companion galaxies. And uh, the evidence for this is, uh, well, in my opinion, it's overwhelming. But uh, when you see things through the conventional lens, you have to introduce things like dark matter and dark energy yes. and uh, the expanding universe, all of these really nonsensical ideas in order just to patch up the theory so that it appears to work. Huh. The electric universe doesn't require any patching, it just works on what we see and it applies really just electrical engineering uh, uh, theory to the universe. And the best thing about that is that it works. 
would you also say that the because I remember when we had uh, Rens van der Sluis with us to talk about what he called plasma mythology. He when he talked about yes. plasma, he said that it was uh, also scalable, meaning that you can actually replicate this in in a, in a miniature version, a microcosm level of this as well, so to speak. So, uh, yeah. in a way, I guess what you're saying as well is that we can do experiments here on Earth in vacuum tubes and things like this to replicate what actually is going on on the macrocosm level. Is, is that correct? That's precisely right. Uh, Hans Elfein, the Nobel Prize winner in plasma physics, uh, pointed out that uh, plasma affects a scalable over at least 14 orders of magnitude and probably more. And that's sufficient to take you from the lab-sized uh, experiment to um, the size of galaxies and beyond. Hmm. Well, it's really fascinating. I, I do want to talk a little bit about here as well in terms of uh, some of the uh, the suppressed science. And obviously you brought up uh, Emanuel Velakovsky. You mentioned Hannes Alfven as well, this, the Swedish electrical yes. engineer who studied plasma physics. Uh, you have a great paragraph on your website that says, um, if I have an underlying purpose, it's you who's writing this, uh, in my life, it has been to watch for intellectual explorers who have been marginalized by their peers. Uh, they are often those who have the audacity to use their imagination on common sense and courage to challenge the paradigm paralysis institutionalized in Western science. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about some of those names. I mean, uh, Hannes Alfien, as I mentioned, okay, he, he got a, a Nobel Peace Prize, I think, but that was in, for, for something else, not in terms of plasma physics directly. And then we have names like um, Michael Faraday, uh, Halton uh, Arp that you mentioned before our recording, yes. uh, uh -huh. Will, William Herschel, and again, then Emanuel Velikovsky. But um, why do you think that the, these fellers' work have been so vehemently uh, suppressed uh, throughout the years? I don't know. It's an interesting topic, the sociology of science, and I have a file which you couldn't jump over uh, on that very topic. <laughs> I'm sure many books could be written about it. Uh, the thing is that we should maintain some kind of uh, common sense attitude towards scientists and realize that they are driven by the same kinds of human uh, uh, triggers as everyone else and their responses to um, uh, information can be just as irrational as ours. <laughs> hmm. And and when you talk about the scientific method which is often used as a blunt instrument to uh, beat everyone into submission, <laughs> uh, it's there are as many more scientific methods as there are scientists. So there is no such thing as the scientific method. There are certain standards that you're supposed to adhere to but often those standards uh, are not are not met. <clears throat> so, what, what, uh, pardon what, the noise. <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, so, so what, what, it's interesting that in that sense that um, we always get fed by this idea that there is a consensus out there. I mean, I, I do want to ask you later, for instance, about global warming. We can talk about that separately, uh, which mm. is another one of these things where, where they they claim that um, it's it's a consensus and all scientists agree, etc. But we never get uh, confronted with the fact that these are only theories, as you mentioned before, uh, in terms of some of the things that Einstein brought forth and so forth as well. Um, yes. Uh, why do well, you I think, think that's a very good point? Mm -hmm. uh, in fact. One of my um, beefs about scientific programs shown on television is that the reporters often state things as facts yes. when they should preface the, the statement with uh, the um, accepted theories or uh, scientists believe, but not that this is a fact. Because uh, all science is uh, provisional, uh, or it's supposed to be. Unfortunately, there is a lot of dogmatism that creeps into science now because you have uh, the cult of the expert, it's been called. <laughs> um, and the problem with that, of course, is that you have uh, science being fragmented into multiple disciplines. And it, it gets to the point where uh, the disciplines can't talk to each other in the same language. And in fact, even within a discipline, I have found at seminars that um, somebody who specializes in one area within a discipline has to explain themselves to their colleagues. Yeah, yeah. So there's this sort of breakdown in communication, which is a, a significant problem. And I should point out that the electric universe grew out of an interdisciplinary approach, which is not taught in any university on Earth. 
In other words, uh, we look at the possibility that the earliest recollections of mankind have something to tell us about astronomy, which we can use to test ideas and propose experiments today. Um, and to also to uh, save NASA a lot of money in asking questions that we really don't need to ask and to ask ones that we do need to ask. Hmm. That's so, you know, that, that that's the whole thing, that uh, the Electric Universe tries to bring things down to common language, common sense, and engineering principle sense, and engineering principles. I mean, there the would be people out there who, who would argue and, and claim that the the compartmentalization of of these scientific principles are in place for a a reason actually uh, i don't know if you would agree with that wall it, it seems to me like that is the case that it's almost designed for a hierarchy if you will to gather all the knowledge at the top and and keep the um, the uh, individual researchers kind of uh, uninformed at, at the lower levels uh, because that's what's happening anyway what do you think about all of that wall I think that's, that is one of the consequences. Uh, the language used in scientific articles is so obscure and obtuse that uh, you really have to work hard to try and understand what's being uh, said. Uh, sometimes uh, the people who do the editorials and so on for nature and science manage to cut through uh, all of this um, uh, jargon and provide you with some insights. but it makes it very difficult for anyone to get uh, the big picture and when you're doing science I think it's important to get the big picture first so that you have some idea of how uh, your ideas fit with other disciplines mm. it, right now you know you can have a problem in one discipline you don't tell the people next door who are working in another discipline that you've got these problems and so those other people assume that answers they get from you are uh, pretty much uh, signed, sealed and delivered and you can take them as gospel hmm. when in fact there are a huge number of caveats and uh, concerns about um, the so-called facts. And this is one of the things that I find quite often that if you... I get referred to papers that are supposed to prove that the electric universe is, is completely wrong or misguided. Mm -hmm. When I go and read those papers I find that the certainty with which I've been attacked has is not reflected in those documents. In fact, they tend to support my view that uh, <laughs> these things are still very much unknown and uh, under still under investigation. Hmm. Uh, one thing there that has happened then, obviously, is that if we go back into history a little bit and mention William Herschel again, he he talked about the electric effects and so forth, and, and he collaborated with uh, Michael Faraday, for instance, uh, and, yes. and, and it wasn't really until our knowledge about uh, electromagnetism and uh, electrical engineering came onto the scene that we started to connect these dots, so to speak. But why do you think that mm -hmm. the electric universe theory have stayed off the map in terms of our educational system? Because it seems to me that the the, the older people who studied this were kind of on the ball, so to speak. And that they were heading somewhere with this theory, but then something happened. Do you know what that yes. was? Uh, what, what happened there? Well, it was an accident of history, I, I think, and that's what I've written in the last uh, article I've just written for my website called Our Misunderstood Son. <clears throat> and um, Herschel says, uh, said in a letter to Michael Faraday, who uh, at the time was uh, the experimentalist working on electricity and magnetism, uh, William Herschel said, We stand on the verge of a vast cosmical discovery such as nothing hitherto imagined can compare with and he was talking about a link that they discovered between magnetic storms on Earth and sunspots on the Sun. So here was uh, an intuitive leap which was on the right track. Uh, the Electric Universe uh, shows how these things uh, actually work. Um, and as uh, somebody pointed out, back in those days and up until the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of scientists were what you might call eminent outsiders. They were not actually trained in the thing that they became famous for. And I think in that article I point out that um, uh, Herschel um, was in some other, or both Herschel and Faraday began in completely different uh, pursuits, mm. but ended up uh, the doyens of the uh, Royal Society in their particular fields. 
of astronomy and uh, physics. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, anyone who tried to do the same thing uh, from outside of discipline would uh, be pounced upon immediately, and they'd never become members of the Royal Society. Hmm. Well, so th this uh, this uh, idea of um, the Renaissance scholar, I think, has gone out the window, and I think that's a great pity. Absolutely. We're, we're losing so much because of it, but uh, that's why we're grateful for the kind of work that you, uh, uh, David, and, and uh, many other people as well who are on the track in terms of the electric universe. And I think it's a, a fascinating theory. And, and just by reading it from a non scientific point of view because I have no background in, in, in terms of science. I'm just very interested in it. It makes more sense to me mm -hmm. because it answers lo a lot of these uh, questions that just that you mentioned before that, that regular science or the, the mainstream theories have to uh, basically these things that they have to make up in terms of to explain gravity and, and uh, dark matter and things that you mentioned before. And uh, yes. w w What do you think then are some of the bil biggest, I guess, fallacies in terms, in terms of that? Is, is it our lack of understanding when it comes to gravity and, and also this in, injection of, of dark matter or is there anything else uh, big, so to speak, out there that, that are uh, specks in the, in the eyes of mainstream uh, uh, science? Well, I think one of the popular ones is black holes. And uh, we have another dissident Australian uh, scientist um, who has done the hard work in the mathematics and pointed out that there were some serious mistakes and made and that black holes cannot exist even according to the mathematics. Now, common sense suggests that it's a simple mistake like dividing by zero uh, because if you try and concentrate matter uh, in a smaller and smaller radius or volume, as you approach zero, of course, the density goes up to infinity and this is more or less what you are talking about with a black hole. Um, there is no necessity for a black hole. Um, the evidence for it is given as the outpourings from the centers of active galaxies where you see these huge jets going from millions of light years out into space, uh, funneling huge amounts of energy and matter away from the center of the galaxy where the supposed black hole is supposed to be uh, gobbling everything in sight. Mm -hmm. All of the activity in the center of an active galaxy can be explained in terms of electrical engineering and plasma physics. The problem is, and this is the historical accident, the understanding of plasma physics and the kinds of experiments required to be done to understand galaxies were not done until uh, long after the standard model of the Sun was in place. The, and uh, that accident is uh, detailed in uh, that article I mentioned, Our Misunderstood Sun. Mm. The important uh, issue is, of course, that if we don't understand the sun, then we don't understand any star in the universe, and we can't go uh, talking about the first few uh, seconds of uh, the existence of the universe when we don't understand anything about what we're looking at. <laughs> so um, this is why I say we don't even know enough to ask the right questions right now to answer the big questions in cosmology. You know, where did we come from? Where does life begin? And all this kind of thing. We can't even ask the right questions about where would we expect to find life in the universe other than on Earth. <laughs> That's just incredible. And uh, it's, it's very fascinating in terms of the, the sun as well. I've been, uh, you know, keeping an eye on this. And, and uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about you know, solar flares and and uh, coronal mass ejections and and what those are. There there's certain expectations that comes from uh, NASA and, and other uh, scientific groups who are studying the sun in terms of what they call the uh, uh, eleven year cycle and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But but right now, as far as I've understood, we, we're in one of these uh, situations where they don't understand why the sun is so uh, quiet, as it were. It, it should be more active at this point, I've heard, <laughs> but it's actually not. Right. Can you talk That's about right. that? That's right. Yes, um, the solar cycle, as it's called, the sunspot cycle, is one of the big mysteries of the sun. It's not explained by thermonuclear theory. You would not expect a solar cycle or sunspots or even the granulated appearance of the uh, photosphere of the sun uh, based on a thermonuclear model. The, what is actually going on is that uh, the thing we call the sun is actually the bright photosphere itself, which in the electrical model is some distance, uh, it's at the top of the atmosphere, if you like, of a body 
which is inside and is of heavier elements, uh, just like um, the other planets in the solar system. So the sun has no thermonuclear engine at the centre. When you look at a sunspot, you see a clearing in this discharge, and beneath is cooler, it's dark. Now, if energy was trying to escape from the sun, it should be much brighter if you were to part the, uh, the obscuring layer at the top. And that's not what we find. So uh, a very complicated theory had to be put forward about uh, magnetic refrigeration and this kind of thing to try and <laughs> make the sunspot cool when it should have been uh, much hotter. So it's just simple things like this that point to the direction or the mistakes that were made in those early days. Mistakes that were made in those early days. Uh, the other idea was that uh, the sun had to have a central engine to blow it up to the size we see, but that makes an assumption that it's just a, a, a neutral ball of gas responding to the force of gravity. But if it's an electrical object, if it's a, an anode in a um, an arc discharge or in a glow discharge, then uh, what we're looking at is not the surface of an object at all. It's it's a glowing plasma phenomenon, like the neon glow in a neon sign, uh, which can be at some distance from the electrode. Hmm. Uh, and now, of course, we see stars which are bigger than uh, the orbit of Jupiter or Saturn. Uh, and the question is, well, how does it uh, blow itself up to that size? Well, it, it doesn't. That glow is an electrical phenomenon. It has nothing to do with the central body itself. So, so I guess also as well that that would explain then why the surface temperature is higher than, than in the core. Is, isn't that what they've measured or, or come uh, the conclusions no. that they made? Now, you have this uh, crazy situation where you have a core, which is at uh, millions of degrees, uh, thought to be at millions of degrees, in order to uh, sustain some kind of thermonuclear activity. Then you have this, the uh, photosphere of the sun, which is about 5,700 degrees, and then you go up into the corona, where it's millions of degrees. So here you have the coolest spot is in between two hot spots. Ah, oh, that's right. <laughs> and it, it, it just cannot work. Uh, eventually, that cool spot must heat up to the same temperature as either the center of the sun or the, the uh, corona. Hmm. So they've had to cook up all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful mechanisms by which somehow energy can get from the center of the sun out of the sun without heating the uh, surface or the photosphere and yet heat up the corona. Hmm. And to do this, they invoke, uh, the uh, physicists invoke magnetism. Now, I had a very telling commentary made by the chief scientist of Australia at a meeting uh, of the, at the university here, where she said, when we don't understand something, we blame it on magnetism. <laughs> and now, it's funny that scientists often have these throwaway lines at their meetings, that's why I attend so many of them, which you would never see <laughs> published in any of their journals. <laughs> but that is precisely what happens. Uh, Somehow or another, magnetism is generated, and they've never been able to show precisely how that happens. Uh, and yet the sun itself is just one ball of uh, complex magnetic behavior, uh, which is easily explained in the electrical model, uh, if it's uh, an anode in a, di a glow discharge, but has no, no business being there at all in the thermonuclear model of the star. Uh, we we're talking about the uh, cyclic nature of um, the um, solar magnetic field and its sunspots. And all of this, too, is explained simply by a varying current input to the sun. So right now we're in a position where the current is not changing. It's, uh, it's steady. But most of the time it is either uh, changing uh, in one direction or another. Mm. And uh, that gives us the uh, solar cycle, the change in magnetism on the sun and the movement of sunspots in latitude. Hans Alfain himself drew the circuit for the sun um, many decades ago, but nobody's paid any attention. Um, Alfain himself uh, didn't see the connection with the galaxy, uh, but that's also been shown now in the discovery of these uh, uh, neutral atoms from outside the solar system. Uh, which all seem to come from uh, this uh, encircling, um, uh, I suppose you call it a cylinder, around the sun. Mm -hmm. And 
the magnetic field outside the uh, sun's environment, the heliosphere, that's the big uh, plasma sheath that surrounds the sun, well out beyond Pluto. The uh, galactic environment also has the steady magnetic field, which was not expected in the standard model, but which was essential to the electric model. Hmm. So we keep getting verification almost on a, a daily basis from discoveries uh, from the uh, space uh, spacecraft and also the new telescopes on Earth. Oh, that's that's incredible. Um, so what, uh, in terms of if we want to look at it from the point of view of predicting then or, or, or trying to understand better uh, so the solar cycles in order to, well, at this time, actually both prepare here on Earth because, again, these major uh, flares, when they do happen, can indeed upset... Uh, our electrical sy systems here on here on Earth, uh, mm -hmm. waves like uh, pulsating e EMF, wa EMF waves going out and all all of that too. So, w does it make it easier to predict then uh, when the um, the peaks or dips and valleys of sun activity is supposed to happen? If we look at it from the electrical universe point of view, where is it still a, a mystery what drives it and and how? Uh, and, and why it's more active at certain points? Well, well we know how current is transferred uh, through space. Uh, it takes the form of uh, filaments and uh, in fa actual fact it follows the same engineering principle that we use with uh, twisted pairs of wires which radiate uh, the least energy. That's why engineers use them for um, uh, signal transfer and that kind of thing. And it turns out that nature does the same in the universe. So everywhere you look in space, uh, at nebulae, anything that's glowing, you'll see this filamentary structure, which is quite striking. And it's not explained by exploding stars or um, shock waves and that kind of thing. Now, most of them are invisible because uh, the, the um, power density and the matter density is uh, so low that... Uh, you can only pick up the signals with radio telescopes. It seems rather ironic that uh, when the radio telescopes were first proposed, astronomers said, no, you don't need those. What would you need those for? Well, it turns out that uh, they will be an essential part of the uh, re revelation of the electrical nature of the universe because they can actually trace these uh, intergalactic, these dark currents, as they're called. Now... The sun itself uh, is powered by these dark currents. So the means of finding out exactly what's going on in our uh, immediate solar system environment is what we need if we're going to uh, predict what the sun might do. And that will be, uh, I think, uh, done by people like the radio astronomers and perhaps these people who uh, now have uh, tele... Um, spacecraft which can detect these neutral atoms coming in from beyond the solar system. We need to know what's going on in the sun's environment because it's the environment that controls the sun. It's not something from inside the sun. Mm. Hmm. You, you know, when you mentioned that the, 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 in most cases, uh, these, uh, the, the t filaments or, or these twi twisted pairs in that sense that you're talking about, that they're invisible. Uh, yes. I don't know if you recall, I think it was back in 2006 when they uh, discovered this kind of what they call a DNA or double, double helix basically right. spotted out in, into space. Does that uh, come into the picture here as well? Yes. In, on occasions, if the matter density is enough or the electric current density is enough, uh, the um, filament will glow. And when it does, you will see these uh, long filaments. And in some cases where the uh, seeing is very good, you can actually see the twisted pairs themselves. And uh, this, is, this is what gave rise to the idea of the kind of DNA in space. And it is a fascinating thing that you see this uh, fractal, this repeated pattern yes. in nature. And the, un the electric universe is a fractal universe because, as we said early, earlier, the um, plasma phenomena are scalable over an enormous range of sizes. So you can expect to see the same kinds of things from the laboratory up to uh, the galactic that's fascinating to me, and and it, I mean, have you done any biological uh, research in this as well, in terms of looking at the human body, for instance, as an electrical machine? In that sense, pretty much, the, 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 if indeed we are driven by the same uh, uh, rules and, and laws uh, in, in one way, what do you think? Yes, yeah, uh, yes, there is a, a pattern there. Um, 
in my research into the nature of gravity, I came to uh, the work by that fellow that I mentioned earlier, who had uh, given a simple explanation in terms of uh, real objects as to how gravity might work. And he said that every subatomic particle is made up of smaller charged bits, if you like. Mm. He called them uh, subtrons. It doesn't matter what you call them. If you can imagine that the electron, the proton and the neutron are actually made up of smaller charged bits orbiting within the classical radius of that particle, then you have an object which is uh, malleable. It can be it can be pushed out of shape. It can be a football shape. Or it can be spherical. Uh, and it can be squished, you know, squashed flat in one direction. <laughs> and by just those simple deformations, he showed that uh, you can explain magnetism and gravity. Magnetism and gravity. So as one simple concept, uh, the explanations just sort of fall out of it. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that if you are going to have uh, the electron, for instance, which is uh, probably the, uh, it's much, much smaller than the, um, the proton and the neutron. If you say that that is made up of smaller particles orbiting within that classical radius of the electron, then it turns out just by simple calculation that those particles must be traveling far in excess of the speed of light. Mm. He calculated that if you could release those particles to move in a straight line, they would travel from here to the other side of the Andromeda galaxy in one second. <laughs> now, this gives you a clue. <laughs> <laughs> it means that the electric force itself operates throughout the universe at near infinite speed. It means that in the electric universe, everything is connected. And this gets you to the idea of the interconnectedness of all things and also the fact that the electric signaling that occurs operates uh, near instantaneously. Now, one of the puzzles that I always had was that, uh, for instance, if you have a, um, a tennis player returning a serve, if you relied on signals travelling along the nerves at a few metres a second, then you would never be able to return the ball. You know, your re reflexes, your actions would be far too slow. <laughs> It just couldn't be done. The human body seems to act as a unit. In other words, the mind, the body, everything is connected. And the signaling between the various components in the body seems to operate far in excess of uh, nerve speed signaling. And according to this uh, model that I'm proposing, it actually occurs at near infinite speed. There is another a benefit of that, and that is it means that... Uh, atoms that are assembled into a complex molecule will do a beautiful resonant dance, which means that it, it has a signal, if you like, which is available to the universe, and other molecules of the same construction will all sing the same tune. It'll be like a symphony all playing at once, but uh, apparently the uh, communication is perfect. However, it wouldn't be perfect if one object was moving away from another and the uh, signals travelled at the speed of light. To be coherent and to be consistent, the signals must travel at near infinite speed, otherwise they detune by you know, the Doppler effect. But according to this new model, they do not detune. The signalling remains perfect, even if they are travelling relative to one another. So, for instance, if uh, there is such a thing as... Um, uh, ESP and so on. It does. It doesn't get detuned if one person is flying in an aircraft and the other one's stationary on the ground. Huh. That's the other thing is that's incredible. The other thing is, and it should have been obvious to astronomers long ago. It was pointed out by uh, the late Tom Van Flanden, the astronomer, uh, that gravity itself operates at near infinite speed, far in excess of the speed of light. In other words, the Earth knows, if you like to put it in those terms, where the sun is right now, mm. not where it was eight and a half minutes ago, and the same for all the other planets in the solar system. If that wasn't so, uh, you would have a, a torque acting on the planets which would sling them out of the solar system in a very short space of time. You would have no solar system. And yet this, doesn't, this obvious point doesn't seem to have um, got through to anyone. 
the other, the, the, the most disturbing thing of all for physicists is that uh, this means that Einstein's theories, his postulates, were wrong. Yeah. And in fact, they were somewhat illogical, and this is why people have such trouble in trying to understand what it was that Einstein's theories were trying to say. Now, the simple fact is they don't make sense. <laughs> and those those who've tried to make sense out of them, you know, go round and round in circles and finally say, oh, well, other people believe in it, so it must be right. Mm. Well, but if we can get, you know, get rid of this business of worshipping the scientists of the past, uh, I think we would go an awful, or we'd, uh, science would progress much faster. It's like Newton said, uh, he, um, he had seen far by standing on the shoulders of giants, but the problem is to pick the right giant and make sure they're facing the right direction. <laughs> that's right. That's a very good point. I mean, that's, a, that's just, uh, that's incredibly fascinating to me as well in terms of the, both the fractal, uh, properties that you, that you mentioned here in terms of the electrical universe, but also then how that actually would explain, uh, if you will, then a lot of so-called paranormal. I mean, they're only paranormal because we don't, you know, understand them yet. These phenomena, which, uh, ha has to do with the interconnectedness of, of, um, you know, either human beings or, or, uh, yes. you know, up to the, uh, up, upper level of this in terms of planetary bodies and things like that as well. And, um, yep. even, even the grand spiral galaxies would not be grand spirals if uh, gravity operated at the speed of light, which is a real snail's pace in the universe. It's a terribly yes. slow. Yes. Uh, ha haven't they been able to, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I mean, they, they had the, they had this rule or law there that nothing can you know go faster than the speed of light. But as far yeah. as I remember, they, they even had experiments here, here on uh, Earth where they've actually managed to speed up um, the, the, speed, the speed of light, so to speak, or increase the speed of mm. light. Uh, do you know anything? They always explain, yeah, they always explain that away as being a, a phase, uh, a, a, the um, speed of a wave, it, it's the phase of the wave that uh, travels faster than the speed of light. But really, it's, uh, the electromagnetic wave does travel at the speed of light simply because it's uh, a disturbance traveling through a medium. It's like um, a uh, stone dropped into a pond. The waves move, uh, slowly away from where the stone was dropped and that is in effect a speed of light. The speed of gravity is the speed of the, if you like, just as a kind of a, a, a simile, is um, is equivalent to the speed of sound through water. In other words, it's traveling far faster mm. than this uh, slow transverse disturbance and electromagnetic waves are a transverse disturbance in a medium. You cannot transfer an electromagnetic wave through nothing. It must have a medium, which is what Maxwell said, but it was discarded by Einstein with no explanation as to how uh, the electromagnetic wave was supposed to proceed. Hmm. You must, if you're going to have an electric field in space, it's got to have a charged particle as its um, uh, origin, point of origin. You can't just sort of conjure it up and say that it exists in nothing. W would do we get any closer to the uh, the mysteries of the origins of of our universe, or at least uh, the the matter or energy within or electricity than within our universe, if we look at it from the point of view of the electric uh, universe? Uh, that's a good question. Um, what we can see, uh, Halton Arp, by the way, the astronomer, uh, was the one who showed that redshift is related to the age more than it is to distance or the speed of recession. And based on his work, he came to the conclusion that the universe is much smaller than we think and uh, that we cannot see all that far anyway. Uh, <laughs> and therefore, what we can see in our small part of uh, whatever the universe is shows electric currents flowing in and out of this uh, small region of whatever the universe happens to be. And beyond that, we are ignorant. We cannot say. So this is what I say. We really need to be a little more, or show a little more humility in uh, our understanding and uh, be more questioning. You know, yes. Instead of trying to conjure up the latest science fiction story to make uh, uh, the headlines and grab more funding, yeah. just show a little more humility. And I think this would actually help in getting students back into science. Right now, they're just staying away by the truckload. Hmm. They, 
because it's boring. You know, they're, yeah, yeah. they're told that you need to know uh, esoteric mathematics. You have to be a mathematical genius, and that uh, uh, most of the work's done anyway. All you have to do is just solve a few puzzles here and there, and uh, we'll have it all. Uh, <laughs> we'll have it all on the t-shirt <laughs> next week, <laughs> which is just nonsense, you know. Of course, and we. It's a, but it's a recurring theme. We don't learn from history. That's our big problem. If we were to look at the history of uh, science, we would find that uh, it was rather like Arthur Kersler has put it in his uh, book, uh, The Sleepwalkers, and more like people crashing into things in the dark. Kersler <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, a, is a magnificent uh, author, by the way, absolutely. Um, yes. If we... Uh, if we round things up here for the for the first segment, and we'd love to continue talking more with you if you do have the the time for us all, um, th there is one thing I'd like to ask you uh, before we do that, though. Uh, in terms of signal transfer, you, you men mentioned this instantaneous communication possibly mm -hmm. going on then between bodies and so forth, and if it if it is and so forth, and if it if indeed is a signal of, and if that signal is um electric in its origin if we can put it that way there's yes. i guess two questions that, that come up in relation to that one is this that people talk about when the term free energy they talk about zero point or tapping into the the field mm. and in that sense that's what i'm reading into this as well that the, this is about this instant communication and w do you think that it would be possible for us in one way to tap into the signal transfer in order to actually read the signal communication that is going on uh, in the universe, if, if you will. I uh, don't know if that's a, too much of an esoteric area to get into, but give us your take no. on that, Paul. No, I think uh, it is possible. It's a, a longitudinal signal. It's the kind of thing that uh, Tesla was playing with. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it is the only way, really, to communicate uh, beyond the Earth um, because otherwise electromagnetic signaling is far too slow. Mm. Um, also, it is the only form of signaling that isn't shielded by uh, plasma uh, sheaths and double layers in space. Uh, and this gets down to questions about why haven't we been able to hear from ET, you know, the SETI yes. project. Yes. And I can, I can tell you why. <laughs> We're using the wrong signaling technique. They would never use that if they're advanced, uh, you know, <laughs> in that sense. Of course. Yeah. yeah, this is once again is another bit of hubris on the part of scientists today thinking that uh, our um, puny understanding of the universe is enough to be able to uh, pontificate about where we will find life and how it would uh, communicate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have a lot to learn. Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, wh what do you say, Walt? Do you have uh, more time for us? Do, are you up for doing an, uh, another segment with us? Uh, yes, I think we can uh, soldier on. <laughs> okay, absolutely. We have so many more questions I want to ask you, but please then, for to a way of rounding up here, the first segment for us, mention your website, mention uh, the book and, and the DVD that you guys have out there as well, so people know where to go to read more and, and see and hear more from uh, the perspective of the electric universe. Yes, uh, my website on holoscience.com, that's H-O-L-O, -O, the idea being that the uh, science is more holistic and interdisciplinary. <clears throat> so holoscience.com will get to my website. Uh, my colleagues uh, have the Thunderbolts.info website, and they also have the resources and forums for you to join if you're interested, and uh, a lot of activity. Uh, in fact, they have a picture of the day, uh, on that website uh, every day of the working week and uh, it's quite an outstanding uh, effort on the part of uh, volunteers. The uh, books and the DVDs and everything uh, you'll find on that website. Alrighty, again there you go, uh, very, very good uh, websites and, and links for you guys, uh, thunderbolts.info and then Wolf's personal or his own website, Holo science.com definitely go over there and check it out uh, but do join us here in the next uh, segment here then for red ice members uh, coming up very interesting stuff indeed uh, stay with us Walt. thank you so much for this uh, first segment galaxies give birth to quasars which then evolve into companion galaxies and uh, the evidence for this is uh, well in my opinion is overwhelming but uh, when you see things through the conventional lens 
you have to introduce things like dark matter and dark energy yes. and uh, the expanding universe, all of these really nonsensical ideas in order just to patch up the theory so that it appears to work. Hmm. The electric universe doesn't require any patching, it just works on what we see and it applies really just electrical engineering uh, uh, theory to the universe. And the best thing about that is that it works. Uh, would you also say that the because I remember when we had uh, Renz van der Sluis with us to talk about what he called plasma mythology. He when he talked about yes. plasma, he said that it was uh, also scalable, meaning that you can actually replicate this in in a, in a miniature version, a microcosm level of this as well, so to speak. So, uh, yeah. in a way, I guess what you're saying as well is that we can do experiments here on Earth in vacuum tubes and things like this to replicate what actually is going on on the macrocosm level. Is, is that correct? That's precisely right. Uh, Hans Elfain, the Nobel Prize winner in plasma physics, uh, pointed out that uh, plasma effects are scalable over at least 14 orders of magnitude and probably more. And that's sufficient to take you from the lab-sized uh, experiment to um, the size of galaxies and beyond. Hmm. Well, it's really fascinating. I, I do want to talk a little bit about here as well in terms of uh, some of the uh, the suppressed science, and obviously you brought up uh, Emanuel Velakovsky. You mentioned Hannes Alfven as well, this, the Swedish electrical yes. engineer who studied plasma physics. Uh, you have a great paragraph on your website that says, um, if I have an underlying purpose, it's you who's writing this, uh, in my life, it has been to watch for intellectual explorers who have been marginalized by their peers. Uh, they are often those who have the audacity to use their imagination on common sense and courage to challenge the paradigm paralysis institutionalized in Western science. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about some of those names. I mean, uh, Hannes Alfven, as I mentioned, okay, he, he got a uh, Nobel Peace Prize, I think, but that was in, for, for something else, not in terms of plasma physics directly. And then we have names like um, Michael Faraday, uh, Halton uh, Arp that you mentioned before our recording. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. William Herschel, and again, then Emanuel Velikovsky. But um, why do you think that the, these fellers' work have been so vehemently uh, suppressed uh, throughout the years? I don't know. It's an interesting topic, the sociology of science, and I have a file which you couldn't jump over uh, on that very topic. <laughs> I'm sure many books could be written about it. Uh, the thing is that we should maintain some kind of uh, common sense attitude towards scientists and realize that they are driven by the same kinds of human uh, uh, triggers as everyone else and their responses to um, uh, information can be just as irrational as ours. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you talk about the scientific method, which is often used as a blunt instrument to uh, beat everyone into submission, uh, <laughs> It's, there are as many more scientific methods as there are scientists, so there is no such thing as the scientific method. There are certain standards that you're supposed to adhere to, but often those standards are, are, not, are not met. <clears throat> So, what, what, oh, pardon what, the noise. <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, so, so what, what, it's interesting that in that sense that um, we always get fed by this idea that there is a consensus out there. I mean, I, I do want to ask you later, for instance, about global warming. We can talk about that separately, uh, which mm. is another one of these things where, where they, they claim that um, it's, it's a consensus and all scientists agree, etc. But we never get... Uh, confronted with the fact that these are only theories, as you mentioned before, uh, in terms of some of the things that Einstein brought forth and so forth as well. Um, yes. Uh, w why do you I think, think that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of my um, beefs about scientific programs shown on television is that uh, the reporters often state things as facts yes. when they should preface the, the statement. With to go along. Uh, uh, maybe you can give us a brief outline of, of the, the theory of the electric universe if we have some listeners out there uh, that uh, might not be familiar uh, with this idea yet, Well, Well, it's pretty confronting. Uh, the first thing we say is that we do not understand the sun and that the th idea that it's a thermonuclear uh, uh, energy source is incorrect. And in fact, it works in much the same way as uh, scientists on Earth have tried to recreate the energy of the sun by uh, fusion experiments, 
where they pour a huge amount of electrical energy into this system to try and get a little bit of thermonuclear energy out. Well, stars do the same thing. They accept a huge amount of electrical energy from their environment, from the galaxy, and environment from the galaxy, and the result is a small amount of nuclear reactions and the creation or the generation of um, heavier elements, which we see in the solar spectrum. Uh, there was an engineer who um, was associated with Velikovsky and whom I consider to be uh, a brilliant fellow, but unknown, uh, and he pointed out that all of the obvious features of the sun have no place being there for, uh, if you uh, just use the thermonuclear theory in an effort to explain them. He said, if you look at it dispassionately, all of the features of the sun can be explained in terms of a gas discharge. And uh, from this simple basis he was able to describe all the features we see on the sun the granulation the spicules the hot corona and so on uh, so um, the first thing we have to get around is the idea that stars are not thermonuclear bombs somehow controlled and uh, uh, and uh, you know contained so that they don't explode um, this also raises the issue then, okay, if the sun is powered electrically, where does it get its power from? If the galaxy is has electric currents flowing in it, mm. where do they flow and how are they generated? And the answer to that is that uh, the radio astronomers have been able to map these current flows by the signals they give out in the radio uh, spectrum, and they find that galaxies are strung like Catherine wheels on these huge intergalactic filaments and so it seems that uh, electric power from beyond the galaxy actually uh, forms galaxies and stars themselves and this raises all sorts of other questions about the big bang theory and um, origins and so on and what we can say is that we don't know enough yet to be able to even ask the right questions about origins hmm. uh, we, our ignorance is so profound since we've got so much wrong that uh, we have to start all over again. What we can say from observations is that the universe is of unknown age and of unknown extent. So it's not, uh, um, what is it now that they're up, up to 16 billion years or something like that? They, they throw out a, a number, but you'd, you'd refute that? <clears throat> well, all we can say is that uh, there have been all sorts of anomalies with uh, these pronouncements, uh, like finding stars that appear to be older than the uh, uh, the universe, <laughs> <laughs> and so on. Uh, it really is presumptuous of us to think that we can talk about origins, uh, creation of the universe, um, and particularly when certain evidence is overlooked. Uh, some of that evidence shows that uh, redshift is not a measure of velocity of recession. Uh, most of it isn't anyway. That redshift is actually associated with the age of an object. So that uh, these quasars, as they call them, which are supposed to be at the ends of the universe and extremely bright, are actually quite close. They're associated with nearby galaxies and they're faint because they are newly born. And there's a kind of a biological aspect uh, uh, to the electric universe because the empirical evidence shows that galaxies, active galaxies, wasn't worth uh, republishing. But he said that he was having an international conference uh, in Portland, Oregon, and uh, asked me if I had something to contribute. Well, uh, as it happened, I certainly did. So uh, I attended that conference and I found what David was uh, working on at that time and I said to him that uh, we should collaborate because what you've shown me are electrical effects in space and uh, from that point our collaboration grew and I spent some time in the US uh, uh, speaking at uh, various conferences over there uh, the Thunderbolts group was set up uh, we began publishing books and DVDs and films and so on and uh, the result of all this uh, has culminated in what you now see on the websites. Excellent. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, really, it's a fascinating 
uh, study also to see how Thunderbolts have, have grew and how uh, a lot of additions have come to it throughout the years. And uh, uh, yes. w- were you also interested in terms of the, 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 the ancient, if we can call it that, then the st- ancient structure of the solar system in terms of Velikovsky and also what David Talbot then brought out that, that you, if I put it this way, do, do you go in line with the uh, catastrophe theory in, in that regard, that, that something happened in our solar system uh, in in past as well? Yes, while I was at university, I spent a lot of time in the anthropology shelves at the uh, university library, and I discovered that the evidence that Velikovsky had amassed for something strange going on in the solar system was, uh, it just leapt off the page. It didn't matter what I read, whether it was referenced by Velikovsky or not. Uh, the picture it was quite clear that something had happened. Consequently, uh, I uh, I decided that I needed to find out what it was that we didn't know about gravity, about what controls the uh, planets and their motions around the sun, because it was evident from what Velikovsky said that uh, electricity played some role, but we don't see that happening today. And in fact, I was lucky enough to be able to take advantage of uh, a trip to uh, Washington, D.C. to ring Velikovsky at his home in uh, Princeton, New Jersey, and he very kindly uh, uh, gave me an invitation to visit him, uh, along with my family who were with me at the time, and so I got to talk to him about this question, because really the astronomers had dismissed his views out of hand because they said that it didn't uh, meet Newton's uh, laws of uh, the dynamics of the solar system. Hmm. And so I said to Velikovsky, what is it we don't understand about gravity? And he gave me a, a slim volume, uh, which he was not keen to have uh, republished, uh, which talked about the cosmos without gravitation. And he was of the view that gravity itself was a weak electrical force. Uh, I took that idea away with me, and a few years later, I came across a small uh, advertisement in the Scientific American. It was in 1981, and it was called the Journal of Classical Physics, and that interested me greatly because I felt that we needed to return to the common sense of classical physics and find out where we'd uh, more or less left the rails, so to speak, Mm -hmm. in uh, modern physics. And uh, that... uh, gave me the clues. I I wrote to the editor of that small journal uh, and uh, we corresponded and visited each other and uh, from that grew the idea of the electrical nature of matter and how the gravitational force could actually be explained. Mm. Out of that, it took many years though to get over the idea that Einstein had in some way explained what gravity was. He hadn't. All he'd given was uh, a mathematical expression which uh, works, but doesn't explain anything. Uh, And so I was looking for a simple explanation, and I think uh, I've found the essence of it, and it does explain how the planetary system could have been quite chaotic some thousands of years ago, and yet achieve a stability which makes it look as though it's been uh, wound up like clockwork. Hmm. Well, it's it's a fascinating theory, and and we're definitely going to get uh, more into it here as we... we Right. Uh, greetings, listeners and newcomers to Red Ice Radio. Thank you for stopping by. It's good to have you with us today. My name is Henrik Palmgren, and I hope that you are comfortable when and wherever you are in the world and uh, ready for some eye-opening, mind-expanding and revealing radio as we are going to go into the electric universe with our guest Wallace Thornhill today, who joins us from Australia. I hope that you're familiar with his work. Uh, if not, this is, will be a good uh, opportunity Uh, for you to learn about some of his work and research. Uh, He has been working close with David Talbot over at Thunderbolts.info and he's uh, one of the voices in the excellent Thunderbolts of the Gods DVD. He is also the author of the book The Electric Universe. Uh, We here at Red Ice have been following the Electric Universe theory with uh, great interest over the years and Wall together with David have been doing some really fascinating work and uh, discoveries over the years. Uh, And as you might remember if you have been uh, with us here for a while on Red Ice Radio, we've had uh, both Donald Scott and also Rens van der Sluis with us on the program before 
who uh, also are associated with Thunderbolts.info. Uh, Wolf's own personal website is holoscience.com. That's the place to go to find out more about him and his material and his book, of course. Uh, but also do take a look at Thunderbolts.info to see a lot of Wolf's contributions there. Uh, so with that, welcome to Red Ice Radio Wallace. It's uh, great to have you with us and thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Hendrik. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Uh, so much uh, that I want to talk with you about and I'm very excited to have you on the program with us. But maybe first as a, as a way of introducing uh, you to our listeners a little bit, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background first and, and, and uh, in terms of when you first got involved uh, in researching the electric universe. Okay, um, I'm an Australian and I was born in Melbourne, in uh, Victoria, and I went to university uh, at Melbourne University and did physics and electronics, but in some respects I was almost self-taught in electronics because uh, while I was at university I was um, fixing television sets uh, as a means of um, raising a bit of cash. Uh, well, before I went to university, I had read a book which I think could be said to be uh, something that changed my life, and that was Emanuel Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision. And uh, I was very surprised when I got to the university to find uh, disinterest and even hostility towards his ideas, which were that the solar system has a recent history. When I say recent, uh, I mean in prehistory, but remembered by... Uh, uh, modern humans. And uh, I began a research year with uh, an upper atmosphere group, uh, but it, halfway through that year I decided that uh, academia was no place for me because uh, I wouldn't get any answers to the questions that I had and I'd have to research them on my own. So I joined the uh, computing industry and uh, spent my career uh, with IBM and with the Australian government. In part of that work with the government, I got to travel a lot overseas and I was involved with the uh, Society for Interdisciplinary Studies in England and was on their committee when I was uh, posted to London for several years. Uh, when I got back home, I uh, got in touch with David Talbot, whom I'd actually met in 1974 uh, at the uh, International Conference on Velikovsky's work in uh, Canada. Mm. Uh, at the time, neither of us knew precisely what the other one was up to. But in 90, 1994, exactly 20 years later, I rang him to see if he had a copy of uh, his book called The Saturn Myth, which dealt with a reconstruction of something that came out of a, a um, story that was not published at the time by Velikovsky about the m memory of uh, the planet Saturn as a sun, which is quite an odd concept. Mm. Uh, David uh, said to me that uh, he didn't have any copies of the book to sell uh, and he did, had no plans to republish it because he'd advanced so far beyond that that uh, it, uh, the um, accepted theory is or uh, scientists believe, but not that this is a fact because uh, all science is uh, provisional. Uh, it's supposed to be. Unfortunately, there is a lot of dogmatism that creeps into science now because you have uh, the cult of the expert, it's been called. <laughs> um, and the problem with that, of course, is that you have uh, science being fragmented into multiple disciplines. And it, it gets to the point where uh, the disciplines can't talk to each other in the same language. And in fact, even within a discipline, I have found at seminars that um, somebody who specializes in one area within a discipline has to explain themselves to their colleagues. Yeah, yeah. So there's this sort of breakdown in communication, which is a, a significant problem. And I should point out that the electric universe grew out of an interdisciplinary approach, which is not taught in any university on Earth. In other words, uh, we look at the possibility that the earliest recollections of mankind have something to tell us about astronomy which we can use to test ideas and propose experiments today um, and to also to uh, save NASA a lot of money in asking questions that we really don't need to ask and to ask ones that we do need to ask. Hmm. That's so 
you know, that, that that's the whole thing, that uh, the electric universe tries to bring things down to common language, common sense, and engineering principles, sense, and engineering principles. I mean, there would be people out there who, who would argue and, and claim that the the compartmentalization of, of these scientific principles are in place for a, a reason, actually. Uh, I don't know if you would agree with that, Wall. It, it seems to me like that is the case, that it's almost designed for a hierarchy, if you will, to gather all the knowledge at the top and, and keep the... Um, the uh, individual researchers kind of uh, uninformed at, at the lower levels uh, because that's what's happening anyway. What do you think about all of that, Wall? I think that's, that is one of the consequences. Uh, the language used in scientific articles is so obscure and obtuse that uh, you really have to work hard to try and understand what's being uh, said. Uh, sometimes uh, the people who do the editorials and so on for Nature and Science manage to cut through uh, all of this um, uh, jargon and provide you with some insights but it makes it very difficult for anyone to get uh, the big picture and when you're doing science I think it's important to get the big picture first so that you have some idea of how uh, your ideas fit with other disciplines mm. it, right now you know you can have a problem in one discipline you don't tell the people next door who are working in another discipline that you've got these problems and so those other people assume that answers they get from you are pretty much uh, signed, sealed and delivered and you can take them as gospel hmm. when in fact there are a huge number of caveats and uh, concerns about um, the so-called facts. And this is one of the things that I find quite often that if you I get referred to papers that are supposed to prove that the electric universe is, is completely wrong or misguided. Mm -hmm. When I go and read those papers, I find that the certainty with which I've been attacked has is not reflected in those documents. In fact, they tend to support my view that uh, <laughs> these things are still very much unknown and uh, under still under investigation. Hmm. Uh, one thing there that has happened then, obviously, is that if we go back into history a little bit and, and mention William Herschel again, he he talked about the electric effects and so forth, and and he collaborated with uh, Michael Faraday, for instance, uh, and, yes. and and it wasn't really until our knowledge about uh, electromagnetism and uh, electrical engineering came onto the scene that we started to connect these dots, so to speak. But why do you think that mm. the electric universe theory have stayed off the map in terms of our educational system? Because it seems to me that the the, the older people who studied this were kind of on the ball, so to speak. That they were heading somewhere with this theory, but then something happened. Do you know what that yes. was? Uh, what what happened there? Well, it was an accident of history, 